Hi, we're on the terrace of the Chateau de Lormoran to find out all about the amazing history of this place. So I'd like to introduce you all to Janet Mead, who is the cultural director of the Chateau de Lormoran. And we're going to have a little chat about the, the history of the chateau. So Janet, just to paint a broad brush picture of history, we had the Romans in Provence. Yes, you they had came, the they saw, they conquered, they left. Then for, they left in about 4 um, AD. And then we had the German tribes coming down into Provence and the Saracens coming up from the Mediterranean. Uh, pretty chaotic time to live in Provence. And around about the 12th century, large noble families began to sort of consolidate land holdings, which is, I think, about when the story of the chateau begins. It can do, because you have the very uh, strong Agud family, which will finally become the senior of this area. Right. And uh, let's, let's start at the beginning of the chateau, which was probably in about the 1480. Right. Uh, now, you have to go a bit further back to understand the history of the chateau, because in fact, a group of people were very much concerned with the construction of the chateau, and they are, in English you call them Valdensians, and the Valdensians are, a, it's like a group of early Protestants, if right. you like. But in fact, in the 12th century, the church was extremely corrupt. And rather as St. Francis of Assisi wanted to go back to a more primitive form of Christianism, a purer form, uh, a certain Pierre Vaudet said, this is, this is not Christianity. We should go back and we should uh, be able to read the Bible in our own mother tongue. And he thought it was very important that women... So this was quite early thinking. This was very early thinking. And even earlier thinking that women should be shock able... Shock horror. Shock horror. Should be able to read. Why? Because, of course, women would educate their children. Mm -hmm. Now, you may see, well, well, so why should the Valdensians present a threat to anyone? God-fearing and peaceful and hard-working people. But of course they did. Because the moment you say you only believe what is in the Bible, and that you should be able to read the Bible in your own language, well, you don't actually need priests, do you? And you then, certain dogma, which were money-making effects, you think of purgatory, to pay a lot of money, to get the soul of your departed <laughs> husband either to remain in hell or to go to paradise according to how you felt about him. Um, these people were then perceived as a threat. And so what was their connection with Long Run? We're coming to that. So you can imagine they were perceived as heretics. Mm -hmm. They threatened the stability of the nation because they were going to destabilize the power spiritual and therefore possibly the powers temporal. So they were persecuted and they had to flee the persecution. And in the early 15th century, in the 1400s, this was a, a moment when the persecution seemed to increase. We have sort of the French royal power up, well, up to the other side of the Rhone, and then Provence yes. is a bit of a And the Provence is sort of also now the Briançonnet, the uh, Embrun, mm. that was the great Provence. And the family, the Agut family, had lands in that area, and he saw that these were people who were very hard working. You had also had in the fourth, you had in the 14th century the bubonic plague, which left this whole area. I mean, half the people died or they fled. So the land was just lying fallow. Uh, the houses were crumbling into ruin, and here you have. He wants to revitalize his lands. He wants to also, this is very French, he had a mistress, in fact, who happened to be near here. And although he had a perfectly good wife in La Tour d'Aigle, but she was barren. Uh, and his he mistress, had a mistress in law, right? <laughs> Marie needed somewhere to live. And so what, in fact, he decided to do was to welcome these immigrants, if you like, who were fleeing persecution, said, well, come here, come to Provence, 
and you can have land which will, you can till, you can work, and you can have all the houses that are in ruin, you can build them up somewhere to live, and in exchange you'll work the lands for me, and you will build me a house, which turned out to be, which turned into a chateau eventually. <laughs> so the very first construction was built and you'll see in the, what we call the Italian style, the first part was in fact the loggia, which was built just as you would find in Verona. Right. Think of Romeo and Juliet and the balcony scene. Well, that was in Verona. It's exactly the same architecture in the medieval part of the chateau. So was it as an, intended as a house or a defensive? It was very building. much somewhere to live. Mm -hmm. Uh, it was called the Le, Le Boiserie uh, because it was, it was surrounded by box trees. And you can, we can have a look and see. It's a beautiful building now, but it was built bit by bit. Yeah. Um, and that was, it started being built in about the 1480s mm -hmm. and it was finished by about 1526. Just about in time. Just about in time, yes. Um, so and to Marie, continue the history. Well, uh, and, and Marie had a son. Mm -hmm. um, when he died, uh, Fulk Dagu wanted to leave this chateau to his bastard son, but his nephew contested the will. And in fact, Louis Dagu then inherited the chateau, which was in fact a very good thing because he had a very dynamic wife, Blanche who was responsible with him, but later on she took it on, on, her, on her own, and she was the one who finished off the Renaissance chateau, which and you can see. The broader picture of what's going in Provence, on in Provence at this time, in the middle of the um, uh, 16th century on now, we have good King René, I think, in, yes. in Aix, who is he, coming to he, the he, end of his he, reign. Yes, what was it, 1493, I, I don't something know, something like, like that. that. Yeah. Yes, um, well, of course, Fulk was his chamberlain. And so when, when René dies, um, his son takes over briefly and then and the, Fr the and then the first. French the power of the French king comes into Provence right. for the first time. And the wars of religion start. That's right. Unfortunately. Uh, now, um, where do you want to go from from there? Well let let's let's talk about some of the, the, the turbulent times in the history of the Chateau. So this was a a Protestant, if we can use that word, stronghold. Um, um, tenuously, we'll use that word. <laughs> well, you have what it was. That Blanche was Catholic, but very tolerant, mm -hmm. and um, the Agut family had always allowed the Valdensians who worked in the chateau to practice their religion. Well, let's let's talk. So, so there were there were there were, there were um, going on in and around um, the Provence region at the time. There was persecution. Yes. Of, of Protestants. So, yes. for example, there was a very famous massacre in Marindol yes. where troops were sent up from Aix en Provence and slaughtered a lot of the population. And burned them alive. Um, and a similar period in time, we have a yes. the Baron of Opeg, you were mentioning earlier, and sending forces to Longman. A really, a, the, really a real villain um, because he attacked the chateau in 1545, and you can still see the holes that were not quite rapidly into this Renaissance chateau in the tower uh, to be able to defend the chateau. Now the reason that he did that was because of course if somebody was declared a, uh, a heretic their, they, their, their goods and chattels were confiscated and so I very much doubt it was religious fervor, it was more greed that was behind this attack. And do we know how many men came? about a thousand, a thousand and there were 50 defenders and of course um, Blanche ultimately was so angry at the way her Valdensians had been carted off, sent to the galleys, some of them uh, they were taken to Joan de, de Roma in Avignon, so the Grand a, Inquisitor. Yeah. It, was, it wasn't a grand last stand, the 50 men did not manage to hold off no, the thousand no men. No, no way, no way and um, in fact Blanche ultimately uh, was able to, uh, uh, I, I can't think of the English word, entente en procès, whatever that is. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Start a legal proceeding, are we there? <laughs> she actually um, went to see the, the king, yeah. as Francis I died 
uh, in 47, in, in the, day, the year before he died, she went to see him. And in fact, he, uh, he was uh, forced to pay uh, a fine yeah. um, for what... It was too late for the Valdensians. Yeah. Yeah. And so um, the Valdensians had built both chateaus. Um, moving on from the wars of religion, we enter a, a more peaceful period in the history of the chateau. Um, and, a, and a much less interesting one, because in fact... Um, we know that the chateau was finished by about 1562-63. Uh, the great fireplaces were the last touch. Um, and then, for whatever reason, um, the Agut family, through marriage, inherited bigger and better places. They left this chateau in the hands of what we would call intendants, sort of managers because the land around was extremely uh, fertile and therefore you have a series of families who live here um, and finally it becomes almost abandoned and people are more interested in the grounds of the chateau. There was a famous Lormoran family, the Girard family. The Girard, yes, but very briefly, they just sort of lived yeah. here in the part of the chateau that was in fact um, taken down later yeah. on because it was out of keeping with the original chateau. So then moving into the 20th century we have, um, we're coming up to the period of 1920. Well in the, in the 1900s the, the chateau was just totally derelict and it was squatted by some rather poor Lourdes Marinois who managed to just enter and squat the chateau and also Lomora is on the route for the gypsies who used to come to the great on um, pilgrimage to the great festival of Saint Marie the okay, Mer. Yeah. and we even have wonderful graffiti in the chateau of uh, uh, significance to gypsies with the three Marys and Sarah the, the black so this, uh, this, is, this all goes back to sort of the Da Vinci Code, or it doesn't go yes, back. But this that, is, yes, yes. Right so it. this is the, the landing of um, uh, Mary Magdalene in, um, right. in, Pro in, in Provence, Provence and, which is where Dan Brown picks up the story and, right. and weaves, weaves his tale. But there's a gypsy set festival that celebrates it every year in, in Saint Marie de la Mer. And then you would come here, and this was a very, very good... Uh, better than the Hotel yeah. Ibis, you see, so <laughs> they would stop off here. And... Um, Finally, the last family here decided to sell the chateau as a stone quarry. Yes. And it's so um, happened. Amazingly. Yes, because in fact, if you see the photos um, of the time, it, it was still a pretty majestic building. Yeah. It wasn't a, a pile of old ruins. It was. You could see that yeah. it was a, a magnificent building. As Jan Janet pointed out earlier, we're now sitting here 100 years from the date when this was sort of on the market on, as a, the, yes. on, the, on the real estate market as a stone quarry on and about to be knocked quarry. down and um, there we are so it was about to be knocked down and wonderful chance a knight in shining, shining armour arrived in the guise of a very educated very rich industrialist uh, Robert Laurent Libert and it was a, a wonderful meeting of, of, of this man who was young, educated, uh, loved, spent his whole life uh, looking at, uh, he had studied archaeology, he'd been at the Ecole de Rome, he was an artist in his soul, but he had inherited an enormous um, fortune uh, that he helped to build. He was an industrialist. It was a famous company here in France called Petrolan, yeah. which was ultimately bought, by the way, by Procter & Gamble. It, he had a wonderful moustache, and it shows that the hair products he sold <laughs> were, really worked. And there he was, a relatively young man in his 30s, and he was just visiting Provence. And he said, that's a wonderful ruin. They said, it's going to be sold as a stone quarry. He said, it's not possible. It was a coup, a, a coup de coeur. He fell in love with it. And he, he decided to buy it. And he did. 
and he bought it in 1920. Um, he bought it for, I think it was 700,000 francs or something like that. Um, and he spent the rest of his life with his friends res restoring it. But unfortunately, he was killed in a car yeah, crash. Yeah, very sadly. Very sadly. Quite soon after he bought yes, it as well. Yes, in 1925 he died. But he had had the foresight to leave the chateau to the French Academy in Aix. And they, for the last hundred years, have looked after the chateau and managed it and ensured its survival. But it so happens that this year is our centenary, so we are putting up a, a, a big exhibition uh, explaining the history of the chateau. Uh, and one of his friends, Charles Martel, who was a painter who helped him immensely in, in the, the deciding what to keep, what to do, how to restore. We have, we're going to have an exhibition of his uh, works because they had in fact men, met in uh, Salonica where he was in the Armée de Lorient during the 1914 war, where by the way he won the Croix de Guerre. Wow. So he, he was uh, a quite exceptional human being, I suspect. Um, when you imagine that 15 years before it became obligatory in France, he decided that all his, his staff who worked in Petroland should have congé payé, paid holidays, that women should have maternity benefit. Yes. Um, so another visionary. Another visionary. Yes. Another visionary. And thanks to him, uh, you can visit the chateau today. And all the, the, everything you see in it, because it's furnished, and it has a number of objets d'art. We have wonderful uh, engravings. We have engravings. This year we've had an, an exhibition of Dürer engravings, uh, Hannah, Van der Leyden. Um, we have a wonderful collection of, of uh, etchings, uh, paintings. Uh, and so that's all thanks to him. Yeah. And it was always a place for artists and residents to yes. come, and you've had famous writers um, yes, yes. working here. Yes, yes. Well, we, one of, Camus came here in 1946, um, and of course Camus is buried in, in Lomara, uh, Bosco. Did, did, did Camus was, ever write in the chateau? Did he, did he use he, it as a place He certainly to write? came and stayed in the chateau. I think they put him, Bosco had invited him. I know there's a Bosco there's room There's a Bosco there. room. Yes. But um, I think they gave poor uh, Albert uh, the room that we now call Scorpionopolis because when it rains, the scorpions come <laughs> creeping up. And he did, he did think that the place was m wonderful, but he said, I think I'll stay in the hotel next time I come. <laughs> um, so, yes, we have a lot of young, talented musicians and artists. We are greatly helped by the Beaux-Arts de Paris yeah. who help us, who send us and pay for uh, gifted young people who come here. And so in the summer, it's wonderful because you have music. Yeah, it's a magical place. It's wonderful. wonderful. We have concerts. Um, because Robert Laurent, Liber, who so appreciated his stay in the Etoile de Rome, the Roman school in French school in Rome, uh, that he wanted other young people to have the same opportunity. And it, it makes it a place that's alive all, all the year round because we also have conferences in the winter uh, on all sorts of things from science to ecology. Um, we steer off religion and politics because we have a very city here in France. We have a <laughs> but um, we, we do pride ourselves on being a social centre for the people around here. Uh, we have a lot of voluntary workers who come and dress up for Halloween, for Renaissance Fest to help us. Uh, and we also economically very important. We have created in the last uh, 20 years, we've created jobs. For, they're all people who live 
it's not in the village in the surrounding villages and in the summer we should have emphasized that you're open and that anyone who visits Lawn can just, visit can just wander up the road yes they and shouldn't ignore open. this magnificent building we the gate also, is open we, we are very happy to see children because we have jeu de peace and this is a place where their imaginations yeah. can catch fire so it is a child-friendly place to visit as is all of Provence because the Provence adore children um, children should be seen and heard good <laughs> <laughs> well Janet thank you very much for this that quick tour through the history of the chateau